Hey, everyone. Today, we are hearing part two of Ori Freeman's story. Now, last week, we ended with the crippling statement that at 11 and a half years old, Ori had to hear from a probation officer that she was no longer welcome in her mother's home. And within two minutes of hearing that statement, this astounding woman said, this is where her redemption story starts. That's pretty incredible. So today, we will continue on and hear that redemption story. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you for watching, and thank you, Ori, for sharing. All right, let's get into it. That was my first time in juvenile hall, and now I'm 11 and a half. I, I think I turned 12. I turned 12 in juvenile hall, and I remember, I remember literally, like, being oh, surrounded with girls now that was in prostitution, like, and girls who had committed robbery, burglary, girls that was in, in the shoe that was fighting murder, getting ready to go to YA, like, I was now exposed at 11 and a half now to the whole right. other world. And then I sat in juvenile hall at 11 and a half for three months. And I kept coming back to court. I kept coming, coming back. And I had an amazing judge. Her name was Judge Sloan. And she actually emailed me the other day. She was, a, I think I think she was at some place and seen me in a magazine. Wow. And reached out and said, man, my oh my, how tables will turn. But she was my judge for years. And she knew. So let me not go there. But at the time I went into court, my mom never came to court. And she was like, I'm looking for the kid's mom. She was appearing when I first was placed on probation. Where is Miss Lorraine Freeman? And in the third month, after my 12th birthday, I think it had to be like June. It was June. I think I got the paper. June um, 2008, 2009. And the probation officer of the court stood up and said, I spoke with Miss Freeman and she no longer wants the child in the home. And when you hear that at 12 years old in that courtroom, that you're not wanted anymore by a family that signed up to adopt you, it was just like another tip of the iceberg. And I remember being in court crying, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. Mm -hmm. I remember calling her, blowing up her phone, her not answering, like, please, please, I'll be a good kid. I'll be a good kid. Oh, so not. Oh. And then I was sentenced to six months. Uh, yeah, I was giving back to the system. And because the system was different, I wasn't placed on foster care. I was going to be on probation until my 18th birthday. That mean I would never be eligible to be adopted. I had to stay in group homes. Mm. And anytime I violated, anytime I had a fight, anytime I did anything wrong, I would go back to juvenile hall. And my life became a revolving door from 11 to 18 inside, inside the juvenile system. And it's so much in my lifetime that those people became my family. And that's the redemption part of my story. One day coming from school, because I was coming from continuation school, the staff didn't pick us up. We would walk back to the group home and the staff would meet us at like a pickup location. There was this guy standing outside on his car, leaning on his BMW, smoking his weed. I walked into this car with the fr my friends from the, from not from the group home, from the school. And I walked up to him, I'm like, what's up? You trying to smoke? And he looked at me and he kind of like chuckled. He's like, yeah, get in the car. And my friend was like, girl, I ain't getting in this car. And I'm like, Psh, I am like, so you got to smoke. Like, you know? And I got in the car with him. And he like, you got your weed? And I'm like, no, you got it. And the way I talked to him was like disrespect, you know, like kind of like the tone. Yeah. And he just started wailing on me. Bow, bow, just wailed on me. And was just like, man, bitch, watch your motherfucking mouth talking to me like that. And he was more of like my gorilla pimp. I just got in a car, thought I was going to like talk back to him and think, thinking I was going to regulate something and control this narrative. Like, yeah, and even if I am with a pimp, I'm going to run this. Like now this time I'm going to control the narrative. Wrong. No. Nope. Right. Got in a car. He started wailing on me. Um, and he was very, very violent. He was more like my first pimp the first night he hit me, but he didn't wail on me. Like he didn't just continue to beat me. Like he believed in love and affection and manipulation more so like showing me that people didn't love me in order for him to love me back. Like that's the way he did it. Like whining and dying and me, getting my nails done, getting my hair done. My second pimp was more like gorilla. Like, so that means like more beating on me and he believed in force, you know? Um, I ended up being with him for a couple of nights and I at left the group home. So then I was at the bench warrant placed out, right? And then I ended up meeting this guy. I think I left him or was going to hang out with a girl, said I was going to go work. 
and he was watching and I called my friend and I remember ending up with this other guy and he was a little bit more abusive. And I remember like the third night I was with him, I ended up getting branded on my neck with a tattoo. So it's not really like dark no more because I've had like over 22 sessions, Good job. but it had his name huge. Yeah. It had a huge name on my neck. I was, so I was 12 with this massive tattoo. <laughs> so I was working with him for some months, ended up going to jail, getting picked up again off of a uh, robbery charge. And so I went back to jail. <laughs> and um, I remember each time I went to juvenile hall, it was like this kid that they first met at 11 years old was changing. The first time I got arrested, I had bushy eyebrows, wasn't really, you know, the way I dressed. Each time it was like, this time I came back with a tattoo on my neck, a weave, eyelashes, long right. nails, like barely anything on. And I remember the staff asking me like, Freeman, I hope you're not out there prostituting. And I'm like, I'm not. That's just the way I want to dress. <laughs> and I had a lot of people that cared for me. Like I always firmly believe, firmly believe that I don't believe that it's about the institutions. I think it's about the people that work right. in those institutions because you can still make impact and change whether somebody is locked up and confined if you really have a heart for this. Um, so like I know a lot of the legislation is trying to shut group homes down and stuff. It was never about the group home. It's about the right. people that just need a clean house. That's what I need to do. And get people that are passionate and really want to love, that can love unconditionally. That's another story. But yeah, I ended up with him and then I was being trafficked for about four and a half years. And by the time I was 15 years old, I had already been to seven different foster homes and group homes. So I was in and out of juvenile hall. Um, I went back and forth to my pimp. Um, and it's a whole nother lifestyle in that, you know, but I can count like within one year, I was raped probably over 4,000 times, you know. That statistic alone, Ori, when you just say that so casually in one year, I was raped 4,000 times. That, like my audience can't fathom that. People don't understand that. Yeah. And your story is helping to under help other people understand how this can happen because you you're you're letting people that are in any other circumstance would be judgy why didn't she leave well she was a kid i don't understand and by you explaining you're a kid when this is happening you have been manipulated you have been beat you have been raped you've been all of it you know, in the four and a half years that I was being sex trafficked, I remember two occasions. I walked into a McDonald's um, and I remember having hardly anything on. It was about, about 530 in the morning. And I know what it's like to walk into a McDonald's and for someone to see you. And I, I and a mother looked at me with disgust, had her child standing next to her. And she turned her nose up at me and held her daughter close. And it was like I was the most disgusting thing walking on earth. And there's no way as a mother now that you can tell me that you didn't know that I was a child. Right. You know, I remember, I know what it's like to walk into a donut shop and everybody's staring at you and you, they know, they, they know what you do. They know you're a night walker. They know, they know, and they don't say anything. I know what it's like for no one to say something, to not do anything about it when you feel in your gut. I walk into stores now and I know when something's wrong and I always say something to somebody, even if I feel something. I was at my daughter's swim practice the other day. A woman came in there with two black eyes and I know it wasn't from no surgery. And I just kept telling her, you know what? It's a lot of services out there. It's human resources, places that will help domestic violence because I went through it myself, blah, blah, blah. And didn't say that she was a victim, but I was just putting it out there that I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be raped seven to 15 times a night. My normal every single day for four and a half years was waking up, making money, handing money over, literally being beat, being raped, chaos, a lifestyle of chaos. Right. That becomes a program. It becomes a program in your mind. So at 15 years old, when you come in contact with people, whether in the system, whether church people, whether whoever, you want to tell me that I should accept your help and receive your love when not one person did a thing in my life. The same people I've come in contact with, even some law enforcement that I'm going to say it's a very small percentage, but I know what it's like to give oral sex to a law enforcement officer and not be arrested. Now, that's a small percentage, but it happens most definitely all the time. For sure. I know what it's like for a probation officer to exchange sex and be a regular. I know what it's like for a firefighter to be having sex with a minor and paying them. Literally, I've walked up to a station with my very best friend who was a bottom, who a firefighter was literally always having sex with her and calling her. These are average day people who buy sex, who purchase it. I was 13 years old when I laid up with a man who talked about his 11 year old daughter and his wife. And 
the sad reality is it is a problem that men by sex, predominantly majority, are there women? Yes. Are there women traffickers? Absolutely. But domestically, 90 probably percent of it's men who purchase sex and also who men who traffic. Oh, you yeah. know, there's a very small percentage of it, but it, of women, but like it happens and it's just, it's the reality, man. Like if people couldn't fathom that this happens in your backyard, it's happening. And I think what I hope that changes is culture around around the narrative of it. There's no such thing as a child prostitute. There's no such thing as a, a woman, even she call herself a sex worker, that you fully, fully believe you woke up one day and your career was decided to be a prostitute and to be raped on your back. You don't keep a dollar of that money. You don't keep a dollar of it. And I think we're in a culture and a time right now that that is everything is sexual. Every single thing or yep. that you should be with somebody that's taking care and you paying you. And it you don't know the cost Every time you lay on your back in an exchange for something, you do not know that the hardest part of my life has never, ever been the rescuing. I was 15 years old when a man, a white male with blue eyes told me for the first time that I was a victim and I didn't deserve everything that happened to me. And at 15 years old, I remember the simple fact that nobody has seen me. And for the first time, somebody seen me. I knew what it was like to finally be seen, to be heard. But I'm going to tell you, it wasn't, that wasn't the hardest part getting out. The 20 times it took, every time that I ran away from the group home that kept taking me back, literally, and I would go back to the track, go back to my pimp or have my pimp come pick me back up. It's not the rescuing that's the hardest part. It's not, it's the staying out because you're being programmed as a child and even as a young adult that this is all you know and this is all that you're capable of and this is all you worthy. Every single day, I make a life decision and a choice, a firm choice to wake up to say that I'm going to live my life in a fulfilled way and that I'm not going to go back to certain things. Like, it is hard. It is not, it's easy getting out of life. I said it. Trafficking is the surface stuff. It's the surface level. It is not the inner deep stuff that I battle with every single morning of having to be present with my child, not yell at my child, not do things that my mother did to me, not, you know, be angry at people, learning how to live a life of service, meeting people where they are, knowing that I'm powerless over the kids that I advocate and that I work with and that I mentor, that I'm only planting seeds and I'm not God, I'm not the savior. The only thing I can do is be able to help you get to the next stage of your, of your life. People don't live their life like that. People don't live a life of service. People don't love unconditionally and do it with no exchange. There's very few people on this earth that are very chosen to do that, that love unconditionally with no strings attached and know that my father, who was my mentor, the man who really, really changed my life, and my mother, Mitzi, and Joanna, the documentary lady, genuinely would be with me when I would be on those tracks and know that I'm coming to eat with them at a Denny's, and I'm going to go back to my pimp and still answer the phone the next time that I say that I'm ready. Like, that's more of what the world needs, and that what, that's what helped me. But my journey of healing is the hardest thing to sit even on here and talk about, not the trafficking. The trafficking is the quick consequence of what happens because of other people's actions and not being a great parent and not being a present parent, the generational cycles of abuse and all that. That's the surface layer. The deep stuff is the poverty, is the generational abuse of somebody being molested, molested and not being talked about. The history of that's in my DNA from my mother. Like it's the it's the bondage that literally people don't know this like trafficking is literally a surface layer. You got a kid that's vulnerable that comes from abuse they're very susceptible to being trafficked period point blank don't matter if she grows up in Irvine or Beverly Hills don't matter if you come from the ghetto in the projects your kid is susceptible to be tra trafficked that's right I'm not the only survivor that has one story there's many stories people who've been to college who went to Ivy League colleges who were trafficked out of college because my story is no different from yours Marisol it's, it's no different the only thing that that the difference is the trafficking but you were susceptible to it and you, you've talked about that you know like it could have happened. It could have happened to a child, somebody like Christine Kane, who oh. didn't have no identity that was born on a birth certificate. Like people really don't know the hardest part is the healing journey to learn how to be by yourself after everything you've been through, right. to learn what it's like to be in a healthy relationship, to learn how to be loved in a healthy way. Trafficking survivors don't come out of the life like always right, like the easy way. We get into domestic violence relationships. We end up in unhealthy like relationships and friendships. We don't know how to set boundaries. You know, we always trying to save somebody before we save ourselves, right? It's all that stuff. That is the hardest part of the journey. The most number one journey I always tell the kids that I work with, the hardest part of your journey is going to be learning how to be by yourself and love yourself and forgive yourself. And not accept what has happened to you, but acknowledge it and now that you do have some responsibility on your reaction to it.
Can you talk about, I know you were first with Saving Innocence and now you're with law enforcement. Can you talk about what you did with Saving Innocence, which is an organization for those who don't know in Los Angeles run by Kim Biddle, who is phenomenal. And can you talk about how you got involved with them and what you do for others that you come across now? So it's funny because I was actually one of Kim Biddle's first clients um, when she started Saving Innocence. So this is over 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. And so when I first was in the system, CSEC, commercial sexual exploitation of children, was not around. There were no programs. There was no nonprofits. Kim was kind of like one of multiple of other nonprofits that was starting up to help kids. There was nothing around 10 years ago. It's only 10 years. Right. Um, and I remember, you know, being kind of one of her clients, but I ended up going off. So I didn't end up being in the case, but I ended up getting a file number and stuff like that. And um, I ended up in this work because Save the Innocence did give me a chance, you know. Um, I had already had a lot of healing prior to Save the Innocence. I didn't have an advocate from Save the Innocence and things like that. My advocates really, truly came to God. God sent my people who are still in my life to this day, who have, I have a great relationship with all my family. Um, and when I got into the work of Save Innocence, they gave me a shot to be an advocate, a case manager. And I ended up having access to going to the same juvenile halls, the group homes where I was raised and that I was in. And I was able to go in and be a light and be a voice and be a mentor to girls that I didn't have while I was there. Um, and I was with them for about two and a half years. And I ended up leaving because um, I wanted to further my education because as a survivor, not for saving innocence, because saving innocence is great. They give a lot, a lot of, man, they give us a lot of benefits and take care of survivors really well. They really do. They pay us really good money. Um, but I left and I went to get go to school. And I still do work with saving innocence. I've done a lot of training for them and a lot of, um, activist work and talking in the community um, and it led me though to doing direct service on my own organically and I found that it was much more different for me to organically meet victims and survivors rather than being placed with them um, because they were ready to change mm -hmm. they were ready for a new life um, and I found that that was better for me that I could meet somebody where they were in all sectors so I have a couple of girls that I met through um, a couple of like homeless shelters and pregnancy shelters and um, through former in recovery that I met and we kind of met organically. So the relationship is very pure because I'm not getting a check for it. Right. I don't get paid to come and talk to you at two o'clock in the morning. I don't get paid to answer your phone call or bring my daughter and have play dates. Like I don't get paid to support you through the process. Like this is something I'm doing genuinely from my heart now. Um, and I'm in school. I'm graduating May 27th with my communications degree. Um, and, you know, I went back to school, too, to prove to finish something I started at 18 years old, you know. And my story is not just one story about trafficking. And I know what it's like to be adopted. I know what it's like to be in foster care. I know what it's like to be rejected. I also, But I also know what it's like to be chosen. And I know what it's like to be loved again um, and to be received and for restoration to happen and things to be restored on God's time and for a fact. I have a beautiful relationship with my biological mom I found five years ago. Um, my adoptive family, we started talking about two years ago. and. It's moving in a process, but um, I've been able to forgive and let go. But I would honestly say my life changed drastically by the direct support. Um, I was sponsored by an amazing man who I met through Jim Carson, who connected us to. Jim Carson has started over, um, has given over a million dollars in um, school scholarships. He has given over 20 cars to youth. He started wow. two homes for victims of sex trafficking, and he doesn't get a dollar from this. And he started an organization called Survivor to Leader. And it's not about all the funds get, go directly to help survivors go to therapy, get rest, pay their, bill for, pay their bills for a year so they can focus on just working, being present with their children, going to therapy, take doing equine therapy with horses or art therapy, or going to do something you love, going to retreat, and not having to allow a victim to survive, right? Right. And um, I firmly have taken on that role and that was a life lesson he taught me was living a life of service and he taught me a lot of life lessons and now he passed on that work to me and Mitzi who is an amazing woman in my life who's like my mother man she um she supported me through my therapy and has supported my business with my podcast and kind of like me doing my videos bought my cameras like I'm a true testimony of direct impact I believe in direct impact do I believe in advocacy work I do but I believe that survivors and victims need direct impact. They, yeah, they need you to talk to them, but man, they need people to help them, support them with buying them a car, helping them with their education. I had a man who I got connected with through Jim who gave me $90,000 to go to school. 
Wow. And he basically said for four years of your, for four years of your life, I'm going to pay, I'm going to give you $24,000 and every month you're going to get $2,000 from me to pay your bills. I want you to focus on school, be present with your daughter, learn how to be a mother, be present with her, love her, be patient, be kind. That's a job in itself. And he's been doing this for over 15 years and he gives it to probably 30 other students in the nation. Wow. So this man has a lot of money, but he doesn't, he does it for good. And I noticed like I've had three cars. My first car got donated, crashed it, was drinking, you know, learned it. Another time, grandparents who took me in at 18 years old, I came back from Africa and they, um, they were from Saddleback Skills for Life, Jeff and Deb, and they took me in their home and let me live with them. And they taught me what it was like to have a loving family. And they got me a car and um, that car ended up breaking down. But then Alan Smith from Saving Innocence connected me with Christina Kuzmik and she gave me a, a Chevy truck that I have now. And that's direct impact. That's how you right. help the next generation. That's how you help victims and survivors, you know? So that's been my life. Ori. <laughs> I'm, I'm a firm believer in what you do in the seeds that you plant is beautiful. So that's me. That's me, Ori Freeman. So and I have a three-year-old daughter who's amazing. Yes, she do. I think that's my number one thing is being close to God and and being her mother, you know, making oh, yeah. sure that I pour into her every morning. She says, I'm brave, I'm bold, I'm strong, I'm intelligent. And I pour that affirmation yeah, into her. And I know for mothers that's going to be watching, like, it's hard. It's a job, man. And she's going to have her own journey. The one thing I know that I know that I'm going to give my all to is loving her right where she is and wherever her journey takes her. Mm-hmm. She's going to make mistakes. She's going to mess up. There are going to be children in my life that are going to mess up. They might go back to life. They might go back and do drugs. They might relapse. They might go back to a boyfriend that's domestic, that is violent. And all I can do is always have open arms and accept them right where they are. Because when it's a time and the time is right, my my, op- my door has to be open for them. So That's beautiful, Ori. You have this resilience. You give people hope. Can you, especially through the work that you've done helping others, what can you speak to that allows you to keep going, allows you to have this hope, this shining light that you are because you are and you do. And I know so many people for, for way less than happened to them would be crying on their pillows and just being victims and not doing anything about it. And you've had so much happen, but you still are out there and you're fighting and you have this resilience. And can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Resiliency. I can't teach you that, but what I can tell you is you can get back up. You got to, if you don't believe and Jesus, right. you better start believing in something. You better believe in, and that's my whole purpose of my podcast is being anchored. You better be an anchor something. You better start using some sage or some stones or something. You better get anchored to something or you going it life is gonna rock you. The biggest thing that I'm asked and the biggest thing I want to get across, how can parents protect their daughters or daughters protect themselves from falling into this? Um, I want people to know too, it happens to young boys. I know yeah. a lot of male survivors, um, in both communities, LGBTQ and trans community, um, and they they have been exploited as well. They were molested as children and things, very abusive homes. And I also know boys who identify, you know, as he, and and they have been exploited through gangs in that way and have been trafficked. So there are a lot of boys out there. Mm-hmm. I want people to know that that I I'm on a board it's true. and on a committee with men who have been. I know a judge, a judge, a male judge, a straight man. Who was trafficked as a child, wow. as a male. So do not think that your sons cannot get accepted. Sometimes it starts off as survival sex or little things, or you think a male doing that. And that's the conversation we need to start having yeah, a little yeah. bit as a community about how come men can't talk about when they get molested and things happen to them, you know? Um, but definitely with your children, just be educated, be willing. When you hear this, go out and look for more information. There's so many other, um, like I empathize and other platforms and other people who have actually put out prevention kind of like, um, work out there. The schools, they are mandated in the state of California to have a small, short curriculum about human trafficking, making sure that your school is doing that for your children because they'll give you all the red flags designed for the age limit. Yep. Um, I actually was working with a student who I met in the sixth grade. She's now at Berkeley getting ready to graduate. And the school wasn't allowing them to talk about human trafficking. And the parents went in there and fought for it and fought for it. Like our kids need to be educated about this topic. Um, but social media awareness, like making sure I know you guys don't want to be in your kids' business sometimes, but monitoring who they're talking to. You need to know the parents of the children that they're engaging with. 
that's the biggest thing is you shouldn't be sending your kids somewhere or even talking to somebody that you have no idea what is the foundation of that family. Um, I think another thing is, is um, when you get educated, like, Talking to them in their language, helping them understand also about like the music that they're listening to, the yes. things that they're watching that's really provoking and um, the content that is exposing them to think that things are yep. okay. Um, watching stuff, maybe even on a news that's about sex work and about my body, my rights. But it's like, there, honey, there are, concept, there, there are things that happen in life that will take a toll on that at the end of the that's day. Right. You don't do something like that forever. And it's not a job. Like in, in giving the backstory, um, I think another thing is just talking about social media awareness in a way of safety. You know, you don't know people. I know that the new generation, you meet people on the internet, but even like, even if it's a parent and you don't have a great relationship with your child or you feel like your child's not going to hear you, teach them to at least tell someone else. There you go. Each child should have a safe person in the family or outside the family that they're connected to that say, hey, my dad is firm on that. He knows my, my father, my mentor knows that if Evelyn, Evelyn might tell him one day that she had sex before marriage. Hopefully not. But like certain things, she might tell him, oh, I got a boyfriend. He might, she might tell him before she tell me. And that's okay. As long as it's not life-threatening, no, it's not going to kill her. As long as she's not in danger, that's their relationship. That is their secret. And I trust him that he's going to help her navigate. That's right. Right? Yeah, that's beautiful. So you always want to make sure that your child has that person. I am a hawk with my kid. My kid knows and it's a challenge as a parent to talk to your kid about it because you don't want to terrify them. But at the same time, I'd rather have my, I, I want my kid educated on what to look for. It's, it's about values too. I think that it didn't, it wasn't just about somebody telling you about trafficking, but also about the value that you pour into them. Like we're in a generation now that don't, sometimes if we don't believe in talking to our kids and explaining to them why, you know, like certain things that I tell my nieces now that are on social media and they're young, they're nine and 10. And I'll tell their moms, get them off of social media. But I can already see relationships transpiring, the way they talk to their friends, the way that they're engaging. And I already go in and I start teaching them about self-respect and about what you put on the Internet. That's and right. once it's out there, it's, it's all those little things already that builds their character so mm -hmm. that they are firm in who they are to be like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you're not a healthy person. You're not a safe person for me. Like, uh -uh, That's right. I'm not doing that. Or I got boundaries. Like, you can't do that. Even if they're 16, 17, you're going to give them freedom. But like they, they're they knowing their boundaries. Like I'm not riding in the car with you. Like anything could happen. You know, like right. And they should think about like they they might be what they think posting is a sexy picture for just their friends. They have no idea. There's there's pedophiles out there looking for this. Like who are you Predators entertaining? Watching. And it's hard yeah, to think about watching. that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Marissa, for everything that you're doing and the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. It really Lori. means a lot too. Thank you. We need more people. We need more people like you. Really, to be honest people that have a heart for this and that's willing to you know do something when they see it do something when they feel it and not just like turn a blind eye that's and right. just be like wow that wow that's pretty bad and then go about their business you know when they know that they can help and make an impact so thank you so much thank you so much if anything i hope that the people here listening to your story when they do see something that they say something because you and i touch on that thing that people saw these mm -hmm. things and nobody ever said anything and I think people need to understand you need to get out of your comfort zone yeah. and go out there and talk to that person. Yep. Go, hey, what are you doing? Do you need help? Yep. Get involved. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but Jesus, yep. you know, if it was one person that would say something, it just changes. And, I'm, and I thank you so much for you being that person yep. for others that say something. Yeah. Thank you. Ori, your advice is so good. And in this day and age, it's something that we have to do. And most of us just trust, um, you know, our kids, friends, parents, of course. But it reminds me of an article that I just recently read in the New York Post. It was entitled, I was almost sold into sex slavery by my best friend, but my mom saved me. And this article was basically about a 12-year-old girl from Mexico, right? And she said that her best friend... Uh, her best friend told her that she was accepted to an exchange program to Spain and that she could take a friend for it, right? So, and, and the best friend chose her. So this little girl is super excited and she starts filling out like these exchange documents. She's giving these guys like all this information, right? And the only thing is that the 12 year old girl became concerned when she noticed a question in the paperwork asking if she was a virgin, right? Can you imagine? They just put that in the paperwork. 
So thank good this, thank God this girl was so smart and like on it, right? And so she told her mother, who then jumped into action, contacted the school, who then told her that there was no exchange program. The mother then went to the best friend's family's home, and that's where she unraveled the sex trafficking plot that the other girl was trying to bring her best friend along to. What they discovered was that the girl had been dating an older boy for around a month, and the boy had actually threatened that girl and telling her that she had to enlist her friend and others to become sex slaves for a huge human tra trafficking ring or they were going to harm her family. Now, thankfully, the little girl told her mother about the question and the mother acted on it and handled the entire thing. And that whole trafficking ring went down. But this is the point I'm trying to make when I talk to other parents is, and to other kids, and to my daughter. You don't know who you're meeting online. These guys are clever. And what they do is they get information. Like, let's keep in mind that this girl had, had filled out a whole application. So now they know her first name, her last name, her, who she's with, her, where she lives, her social security, if she filled that out, all of it, just giving them all the information. And what they do is they threaten harm to the family, which really honestly is a testament to some of these girls, you know, because they're trying to protect their family. They're trying to protect their mother. And I've told my kid, I've been like, if anyone ever says that you have to do something or they're going to hurt me, they're lying. It's never going to happen. And they're preying on the fact that you love me, so you'll do it. And that's what these guys do. So I, I, I just, in this day and age, we cannot be too careful. We truly can't. And so I, I just love that point that you made about you need to get involved. You need to get nosy. You need to find out where your kid is spending the night. Who are your kid's friends? Who are your friend's who are their parents? Is it safe? Who's going to be there? Doesn't matter. In my mind, it's better safe than sorry. And what I try to do is I try to tell my daughter why I'm like that. And she does know. She understands. Um, but I'm just, I'm really glad that you made that point. Thank you. If you are enjoying this podcast, please hit the subscribe button and visit us at www.slaveryfreeworld.org and feel free to leave your comments and questions. I want to hear from you. As always, thank you for listening.